All right, it's 10 a.m., so let's get started. Welcome to Making Your Course User-Friendly for Everyone. This presentation is being recorded. Everyone is muted on entry, and please keep your microphone muted unless you're asking a question, just to help avoid background noise. You can enter any questions you have in the chat window as we go along, and I'll relay them to Terry. Again, welcome to Making Your Course User-Friendly for Everyone, presented by Terry Golightly. Terry has been working with Sakai since 2006, when LAMP moved to Sakai back in the day. She was at Kentucky Christian University at the time and was motivated to formally become an instructional designer by getting her master's in education, specializing in instructional design. She changed her employment to Johnson University in 2016, where her focus has been on quality assurance and accessibility in course design and content. She's been in the Ally Group for about three years and participated in several other Sakai community groups. She and her husband have three grown children, no grandkids, two cats, and a dog. Terry, take it Thank away. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, what I'm sharing with you is a, is a Sakai lesson page rather than a PowerPoint presentation. That is because part of my goal for this session is to show you what an accessible Sakai page looks like. Um, so what I, I was meeting with my physical therapist at one point and uh, looking across the room, I saw these color coded resistance bands. And I asked him, I said, what does a physical therapist who is colorblind, how does he function with those bands that are color coded? And he said, what? And I said, well, when a physical therapist is colorblind, how do they manage those bands? And he says, well, that doesn't happen. And I said, in a room of 100 physical therapists that are male, because colorblindness is almost an exclusively male issue, there will be 10 or 12 colorblind physical therapists. And he said, no, that doesn't happen. And the person next to him that he worked with every day said, I'm colorblind. And he was astounded. Now, the, thing, the truth is that we don't always know who needs special considerations, who's colorblind, who's whatever. And especially in an online course where you're not seeing the person physically. So defining an accessibility issue, we need to look at the official definition. It's any condition, it's physical, mental, permanent, or temporary that affects a person's ability to function in life is a disability. And we need to be sure that we're designing our courses so that anybody that approaches them has barriers removed wherever we can. So there are some examples there, um, mental, physical, sensory, intellectual disabilities. They need to have the same opportunities to acquire the same information that anybody does. And too often we think that this is, that we're talking about somebody who's blind and needs a screen reader. But we have to realize that we need to expand our definition. <clears throat> You might have somebody for whom English is a second language and they need the closed captions because they don't understand the spoken language that well yet. All kinds of issues. Here we have somebody who's looking at a highly expanded magnified screen because of low vision issues. There are legal concerns about accessibility that are addressed in, with the Web Accessibility Initiative and what they briefly, I just briefly want to go through the standards because there is an acronym that helps to define that, and that's P O U R, poor, that all content must be perceivable. You have to be able to see and hear it. And that's important, not see or hear it, but see and hear it because some people will need to be able to read it and some people will need to be able to hear it. Um, that needs to be operable. The person interacting with your content has to be able to do and perform those tasks which they are required to do and perform. It needs to be understandable through multiple sensory inputs, not just in one way. It's not a matter of just seeing the video. You have to be able to see the content on the video. 
It has to be robust, and that means it needs to be adaptable to different levels and progressions of technology. So those are the four basic acronyms of what we must be looking in our web content. <clears throat> Legally, the students are not required to notify you if they have a disability. So when you design, you need to presume that you're going to have at least 10% of the men who are colorblind. There are all kinds of accessibility devices that are available. And these are generally motivated either by touch screen or by uh, voice controls or by keyboard. And you need to be sure that uh, your content is available in those ways. Probably the worst way to do that is a basic PDF document that has not been remediated. Somebody told me, well, if it's on PDF, the screen reader can read it. Not true. What we're going to talk about today though is the lesson page. Um, because what Sakai does in their accessibility, Sakai tests for accessibility all the time literally all the time, yearly updates, make it an ongoing process, a constantly moving target. There is a VPAT for uh, Sakai 19. The process is underway now to make one for Sakai 20. A VPAT is a voluntary a statement of what their accessibility compliance is. Every time you go to a Sakai page at the very bottom, well, I'm, I'm on the at full screen view, but usually if you're not in full screen, you'll see at the bottom where the accessibility information is. But as accessible as Sakai is, that's only what Sakai puts on it. When you put content on, you need to make sure that what you're putting on is also accessible. And so that's what we're going to talk about. What are some of the accessibility barriers we create? <clears throat> When we put on content, page content that is disorganized, it, uh, screen readers, um, people who have reading comprehension issues, who maybe have low vision issues, are going to, they're going to have a hard time getting around our page and understanding what the page structure is, where to go to get whatever they need. Here you see on the left, the, the, the tips about your page structure. And immediately to the right, if you look at the page source material, this is what you see. What this has, those little things right there, the tags, um, those tell the screen reader what kind of structure it's reading. So when you do bullet points, instead of typing in a dot, you need to use the bullet tool because the bullet tool puts in those tags so that a screen reader says, okay, we're talking about a list. Well, it doesn't do it in that, you know, list. And then it starts reading out the list and the hierarchy of the list. In the page structure, the hierarchy is key. And that's what you're seeing on the page when we do the heading styles. So we're looking for um, key things in, in, uh, in web design that Sakai tries constantly to improve and upgrade, um, but remembering that you need to be organizing your content for maximum usability. Some tips for writing for web accessibility. You need unique page titles. You need headings that are meaningful. You need to stop using URLs and use meaningful link text. We need to create transcripts and captions for multimedia so that if you've got something visual, you have it also represented in text. If you have something in text, you have to be able to, to hear what that text is. That hearing is generally provided by screen readers, not always. You need to provide clear, not wordy instructions, very, very concise and all content should be weeded out of anything that's not necessary. So when we go into uh, structuring our Sakai pages, here's the elements that we want to include. Over on the right is an illustration of what a heading structure should look for. And basically you've got H1, 
the heading level one is going to be your page title. It's what this page is about. Then heading levels two are, um, are some uh, the beginnings of the breakdowns and then three and following three, four, five, six, because it goes up to six, gets more and more granular for the content. And what we have here on this page, I have a page header, which I really suggest because the page title is going to be heading one. You want to try to just have one heading one unless there's a really compelling reason to put another heading one on the page and not start another page. Heading two then, perhaps in this situation, in this paradigm, we have a description of what the, the content is on that page. And then we have the second one is then the objectives for that page, what we're going to do uh, on that page. Now in Sakai, if you use the collapsible sections and if you use Sakai tools such as the checklist tool or the question tool or those other kinds of tools that you insert, those are assumed to be heading level three. So you do not want to start the page by going in and putting it in the section thing. That is not an acceptable start to a page because that is heading level three. And you need to start with heading level one. That said, if this is level three, then anything contained within a level three heading needs to be a four. Okay, so when you go to the CK editor in here and you put a title in here, this needs to be a four. Now, the exception here is if you have reason to not use the section level, but are putting your heading level three in the CK editor itself, that the sections should start with three and then within the sections, go to four, five, and six. When you don't use headings, this is a great example from the Social Security Administration training on accessible documents. Here we have on the right of this visual, anybody who's cited can see immediately the structure of the page and how to navigate through it. Somebody who's got a screen reader here in the, in the right to the, of the graphic, that's how it looks to them. Note that it even reads out blanks and, and typed extraneous content that you put on there. So you need to be really careful about organizing your page and not just typing your way through it, but using the headings in the way that it's designed. Your page hierarchy should look something like this. So you've got the page heading at level one and you've got subheadings there and those subheadings can, you know, the way that you organize your page, you could have twos down the page if you're starting another section of threes. But this is giving you a sense of the idea of the hierarchy. You can't have a three if you don't have a two. You can't go one to three. You can't go two to four. You have to have a, the section level three underneath the two. That way, it, that's how it's going to be navigable. So here is how you're going to select your heading, although I already showed you some. One thing that's helpful is <clears throat> if you're not sure, you can do, you can select content and clear the formatting. So you can be sure that you formatted everything right. But if you are making this a heading level, then you select your headings here under that, where it says normal, a paragraph format. Okay, so if we select that as a heading level three and then go out, okay. Any questions that are coming on? It's great. The proper use of tables. Tables 
must not be used for layout purposes to try to place things on a page. Tables are for data. The difference, uh, it, it's, it's tempting sometimes on Sakai since we don't have a lot of layout options to try to put tables on. I've seen professors use tables to format indents when they should be using the list and bulleting tool. Um, doing all kinds of things. Here's an example. <coughs> this is a data table. This is a layout table. Now a person with a screen reader and looking at the reading order in that, their screen reader is going to read basement up, toilets flush, must. That doesn't make sense. A, a, a sighted person can, can kind of see that it's Basement toilets must flush up and it becomes visual and it just, um, the, the reading order is all messed up. So your content is messed up. So we want to avoid tables for anything but data purposes. We don't use tabs or spaces to create tables. You have to use the table tool because again, it is, um, it is formulated with the tool to be tagged properly for screen reading. Terry, we do have one quick question. Okay. Uh, Kent says, sorry if you missed this, but he wanted to double check what heading level the subpage buttons were considered to be in Sakai. They are also three. So if you put a subpage under a level three heading, you've got some redundancy there. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, all of, all of the tools that you, if you go up here, and look at all of these tools, they will all embed at a level three. You can, yeah, you can see that by right clicking on the page and going to the source code. Although there's a whole lot of stuff when you do that, um, but you look down and you go, you know, you can find it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you want, when you are talking about your tables used for data, you want to use simple tables. If you have a complex table or a compound table where you're combining different sets of information into one table box, you need to break them up. Because what the screen reader does is it relates this information and this information to this information. So if you have lots of extra cells hanging out, it's like um, normalizing a table in a database or something. If you have a lot of extra cells hanging out or you try to merge cells or you try to um, say, oh, well, I, I think visually on the page, it would look better if I kind of smushed these together. Those will make that un inaccessible. So you want to avoid doing that. <clears throat> Your uh, heading titles need to be full text Here's a problem with this one. When the screen reader gets that, it reads that header one, one what? Two, two what? You know, it, and so you need to have meaningful headings there and they need to be fully spelled out. So that's going to make a big difference in uh, the comprehension of the table. If you're on something like Word or something and you're constructing your table there and it goes multiple pages, you need to repeat the header rows because if you go onto the second page and there's no header row, the screen reader loses its track of where it is and what the data is relating. I want to talk a bit about reading order. <coughs> Picking up a frog or something is crazy. Reading order is always important but particularly in tables, because if you don't check your reading order, although in Sakai, I have not had a problem with reading order. It does it if you do the, if you format it right, it does it right. But the reading order needs to go from the left to the right down. So you've got um, a header, 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 and then you've got the row, 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 and it goes uh, left, right, left, right, all the way down. And it's really easy to get it mixed up if you're in a different application. But reading order, this is a good place to bring that up here too. Not totally intuitive on Sakai, but when you go to the reorder page items, 
uh, you've got this here that lists each item that you have, and you can change the order of things if you need to for whatever reason. Um, and if we, uh, maybe you want your column break to be in a different place, and you just drag and drop where that section break is. Um, and you, or you can eliminate an item that way. Not everybody <clears throat> knows that the reorder page is there, but there are times when you, oh, I wish that wasn't there. I wish it was here instead that you can go to that reorder tab and, uh, and, and take care of that. The accessibility checker in Sakai, it does not check page accessibility. It checks the CK editor accessibility, just what's in the CK editor box and it will check this little guy right here is your accessibility checker. And it says document, but what it means is box. Um, it just doesn't check the whole page. You have to take the responsibility for doing that. Any question on tables? lists. I get a lot of <clears throat> faculty that get uh, kind of get mixed up on what's the difference between a list and a table. Because a lot of times they make a table of lists. If it's a list, make it a list. If it's a table, make it a table. Um, here are some basic things um, on, on making for easy reading on computers that's formatted in a list format. A list is, and there are times when sometimes lists are mixed up with subsections. You'll get a, a, a list that is three paragraphs long. Maybe you mean, need to think of that as a subsection. So <clears throat> we want to avoid typing. We want to do word processing. So you need to format your list. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I don't know why I'm getting so hoarse. You need to format your list with the list tool, which is this is the numbered list, and this is the bulleted list. If you want to change the format of your list, you can right click and go to numbered list properties. And you have a limited range of things that you can change it to. But if I want to do this instead, and I want to start with number four, <coughs> not 41, then, <coughs> then it will make that change. So that's what this is illustrating over here. Any questions on lists? Um, the comment that I would make on this is this is part of the general paradigm of simplify. Simplify, don't make don't make it complicated, make it simple. Just because it looks neat is not a reason to do it. Because honestly, you're not the person you're doing it for. Okay, what about links? Links can be very problematic because a screen reader does not read out, I, I, a screen reader reads out the link character by character full on and it's usually totally meaningless. If you go to the top of the page here and I just had that link in there, you don't want the screen reader to read that out. It doesn't mean anything. So it's part of the accessibility standards that the links that you show should be meaningful. And that, in, that includes not using the little thing of link, click here, you know, go here to whatever. But here's the, here's the example. This is the link to the style manual uh, for the APA version seven. But this is not what I want the students to see. I want them to see this. So how do we get there? When you go to the CK editor and you double click the link, you, you change the display text, okay? And that's what the student will see to link to this uh, to this URL. So it's not it's not all that difficult to do. You just have to be careful to do it. 
Same thing with click here. This doesn't mean anything. The linking happens with this tool. So if I want to link or unlink, I go up here and I can insert the URL there. So I'm actually linking the text that I highlighted, putting the URL here, and then that's what will show up here. And as, as common as that happens and as simple as it is, it really needs to be addressed in order to present an organized, a fully organized page for our students. Alternative text. <clears throat> when you have a picture, you need, if it's meaningful, you need to describe it in alternative text. And you find that if it's not meaningful, if it's just visual, um, then Sakai will ignore it. A lot of times the different apps will, uh, will say, there's a picture here and I don't know what it is, but if you don't put the alt text in, Sakai will ignore it and not read it out. But here is where you put the alternative text in. Alternative text should be no more than about 15-ish words or it gets clunky. When you have more words than that, you need to consider a text description so that maybe if you've got a, a big thing, um, I'm showing you right here. See, here's my table of lists kind of thing. And what I did with this is I thought, okay, this is a bunch of lists and a screen reader is not going to read this. It was a graphic anyway. So you need to present a textual, you, that, that same content in a textual version. So this is added into there in a way that a screen reader can read it and the student can get that content. Another example is something like this. And I said to the teacher, I said, look, I can see this thing and I can't understand it. And so you need to write out something that explains what it is the student's supposed to get from this graphic. And so he did. And that's also to point out that when we're dealing with these issues, we're not just talking about accessibility to people who have, may have some challenges we're talking about improving the experience for every student um, because stu students uh, who, who might use, I mean, I use closed captioning all the time, not because I need to, but because it makes things easier for me. So that improves the overall experience. Colors and fonts. This picture right here has all kinds of color problems. I don't know about you, but I can't read what that says. And a lot of people won't because the, the, the color contrast there is so problematic. Um, and we don't think about the color contrast so much as, as we say, looks good to me. Well, it doesn't matter if it looks good to me, it has to be usable by the person who needs to use it. So that applies to colors and it applies to fonts. People who have any kind of reading disorder or learning disability will have trouble with fonts like these. The screen reader will not read fonts like these. So we want to avoid fonts like these. Basically, you want simple fonts sans serif, although Times New Roman scores pretty well on ratings. Um, but, but you want to stay with the simple fonts. And there's good reasons to argue that the default font on Sakai, which is Arial, um, is probably good for just about everybody. Color contrasts. You need a good color contrast tool. I like the color contrast analyzer because it sits on my computer and I can use it on my desktop or I can use it online. Um, it's put out by Path Yellow Group. There are great con web contrast uh, applications that are out there with WebAIM and, and different ones like this. But when you have contrast issues, color issues, you need to also consider adding shapes and patterns to graphic elements in, like maps or uh, this kind of thing so that people who have color issues will be able to discern the content that you're trying to put out there. Some tools that are there that are out there for you to use include the color contrast 
analyzer that I just mentioned. The web aim has one, the contrast ratio, those are all good tools. Um, the, section, the section 508 resource that I have for you has some good information on creating accessible documents. Microsoft has accessibility video training. You want, if you want a Sakai source, the University of Virginia, it's a great source. They call their Sakai instance collab. Um, if you're looking for specifically the accessibility tips, you want to look under the tab that says getting started. WebAIM Hypertext also has some good resources there. And I am open to receiving any um, emails or inquiries about any of this content or whatever else. I think that puts us at 10.30, Christina. It does. Is there any other questions for Terry today? Doesn't look like we have any other questions. So thank you all very much for coming. Oh, Terry, we did get one question here from Julie. Is there an easy way to copy the properties from one lessons page to another, fonts, et cetera? I, that's one reason why I uh, go with defaults um, for fonts. Um, if fonts can be a fussy thing if you if you change fonts in in every you know in every box that you work with or every page. But no, I would. The only thing I could think is if you duplicate the page, if you go up to the top, and, uh, when you're going to uh, more tools and add more pages. You can make new pages copies of the current one, except for some pages. And then, then you can change the new page to whatever it is you want. And then Tiffany also points out we can use the custom CSS to control the fonts as well. And and uh, yes, and and I do that. This is this page that I'm showing is just done with all the defaults. We do use CSS at Johnson, but I don't have a problem with the look of this page. So, and we said Ariel was the default font in Sakai. Yeah. Yes. And. There's, is there anything such as the styles in office? The styles in office, usually I use those for heading levels and that kind of thing. So I, um, I don't use it really to govern the, the Word document. Um, the accessibility guidelines talk about PowerPoint. You have to change the PowerPoints into PDFs. The accessibility guidelines say documents should be either in Word or PDF, um, but you do need, it is helpful in PowerPoint if you get the styles right based on the template because those usually have the reading order set and the heading style set. I don't know, Office is kind of a general thing. Um, so I'm not sure if you mean Word or PowerPoint. Yeah, but I don't think there's an equivalent of styles and being able to like change the font of brand size and look of the headings and fonts. There's, you can't, you can change the look of the headings and fonts um, if you, if you just, you can uh, do the same thing you do with anything. You can change your font size, that, and you can change the font style. Um, but, but, but it will still mark it as a heading one. And that's the key thing. And then when you hit this button here, it removes all the formatting. But you can't do it for the whole page. You can only do it for the CK editor box that you're in. All right.
right, well, since we're over by about five minutes, I'm going to end this presentation.